Welcome to the Family Bible Study, Tilling the Soil. Thank you for joining me once again for our Monday night digital small group. Now, to give you guys an idea of what we'll be studying from in tonight's program, we will begin studying the establishment of the early church as recorded by Luke in the book of Acts. But first things first, before we get started with the program, let's begin in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to gather like this again, to gather once again in your presence to study your word. Lord, help us to come to a greater understanding of your word, this word that you entrusted us with. Help us to develop a deeper love for it and for you. And please, as we sit here and listen, to open our minds and our hearts to you. And please help your spirit to speak through me here tonight so that that way we can get the full benefit of your word, Lord. And I pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So for tonight's lesson, let's begin in Acts chapter one, verse one. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach. So as we begin the study from the book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles, we come to the second book written by Luke, and Luke is addressing his book, which is really, you know, they were really scrolls at the time, but to the same person he addressed the gospel of Luke to, Theophilus. Now, the name of this person uh, that this is being addressed to has led to people wondering who Theophilus was, because the name itself means God lover. So some have wondered if Luke wasn't addressing this to the church itself. Almost like Luke was addressing it to us personally as followers of Christ, which makes sense. However, in the gospel of Luke, he begins in verse uh, chapter one, verse one, in as much as many have taken in hand to set order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. So he's talking about the other apostles, um, basically Peter and Matthew, who with John Mark wrote Mark and Matthew, just as those who have from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the words uh, of the word delivered them to us, basically since Theophilus and Luke heard it from eyewitnesses of the events of the gospel, probably uh, Paul. It seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So basically that he was taught. Now, the title though, most excellent, most excellent Theophilus, that most excellent meant something in the Roman Empire. It was a way to address people who held a high office in the empire. So this leads us to having and understanding more that this account was written to a very specific person. Then we have to answer the question, who was this very specific person then? And once again, we would end up needing to speculate because we simply don't know. Now, we, we do know that Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. And in those times, doctors were often glorified slaves. To become a physician took a very gifted learner like now, but also like now. It took a lot of money to pay for the education. And back then, very few people had a lot of money. So typically, a physician became a servant, almost a slave, a, a personal physician to a wealthy person who was willing to invest in their education, which leads us to the fact that it may have been Luke's benefactor that this Theophilus was, his employer master is the one who sent Luke out to create this account, both the gospel and the book of Acts. And that, you know, followed after Theophilus was taught the gospel by one of the apostles, most likely. And as I said, probably Paul, because Luke had traveled around with Paul at certain, uh, at certain points during Paul's ministry. And this was always the idea I had in my own mind, in my own head, and it's still kind of the one I hold on to, 
But then I came across a third option that I hadn't heard before. Now, when I say third option, I'm sure there are a thousand theories that have popped up over the millennia. So I really mean like the third plausible option, the third option that isn't some bizarre conspiracy or complete heresy. But this third option is that Luke's gospel and the book of Acts were written by Luke as a legal document to help defend Paul during his upcoming trial before Caesar, before the emperor of Rome. Rome, like us, is a was a nation that was very big on paperwork. They were very structured and bureaucratic, just like we are now. So it makes sense that in a trial to defend, they would want paperwork as well. And this idea holds a lot of weight as we see Luke, we know from the Acts and uh, Paul's epistles, was a companion of Paul's. He traveled with Paul and Silas for a time. And, And seeing as the book of Acts ends with Paul awaiting his trial before Caesar, instead of continuing on to chronicle Paul's death, which would happen shortly after this account was written, it would make sense that this was being compiled and written by Luke as a record of Paul's actions and behaviors in light of the seriousness of the charges against them, especially the book of Acts. And since Paul lived for Christ in a way that seems almost impossible to live up to, Luke was led by the Holy Spirit to record the bio-epic that is his gospel. And honestly, it, it could actually be a combination of the two. Maybe this Theophilus was Luke's master, and also the one trying to defend Paul. Maybe Luke's master himself was a high-ranking Roman official who was trying to defend Paul in Rome. No idea. But regardless of what it is, regardless of what Luke meant to accomplish in writing these two accounts, God preserved them for one reason, to glorify his name, to glorify him by edifying his bride. By bringing his bride knowledge of him with a definitive record of the history of the early church, which is what the book of Acts is, and with the most detailed record of Christ's life on earth. You know, there are still some things in the other gospels that Luke doesn't cover, but Luke's is the most, it's not complete because it doesn't have in everything, because like I've said before, The Gospels aren't puzzle pieces. They aren't meant to be fit together neatly. There's a harmony to them. But Luke's is almost the most detailed. He tried to crush everything he possibly could into that one book. Whereas some of the other Gospel writers like John had a very specific idea of why he was writing the book. He was writing it to believers and to unbelievers so they would come to faith in Christ or strengthen their faith in Christ. Luke's was more about, this is everything about Christ I could find to prove to you that this was true. But honestly, whatever reasons we think we are for doing anything, God has his own plans for that work. Luke may have had whatever plans in his mind for writing these documents he wanted, But it didn't matter because God had his own plans for Luke's writings. Moses killed an Egyptian out of anger and revenge for his kinsmen. God used that action to remove Moses from Egypt so as to refine him into the shepherd God would need to lead his people to the promised land. It didn't matter what Moses thought he was accomplishing in that action because the Lord had a greater plan in store. Our lives are much the same. We follow God. We follow Christ. And when we do, he'll lead us to do great things. And sometimes those great things end up being far greater than we could have ever expected. Because what we thought would come of them paled in comparison by what God knew would come of them. So while it's cool, it's fun to wonder about the whys of Luke's gospel in the book of Acts, The most important part isn't the why Luke wrote them. If that was truly important, the Lord would have preserved that knowledge. What's important is that the Lord preserved the accounts of Luke and gifted them to us, to his bride, 
as further evidence of his glory in his enduring loving kindness, so we would come to know him greater. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. So during his first book, the first scroll containing his gospel account, Luke chronicled everything he could about the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth, where he came from, how he was born, the places he went, and the miraculous works he performed. Everything Jesus began to do and teach. Now, Luke used the word began. Why began? Well, it's because Jesus's ministry didn't end with Jesus ascending into heaven. See, the Gospel of Luke is a record of Jesus's life and ministry, his life and death, his resurrection, the book of Acts. That is the continuation of that ministry, the record of the formation of the early church, its struggles and victories. It's taking up Christ's cross and bearing the burden of his ministry to make disciples of all the nations, blessing the world by being the instruments that would carry out the covenant of Abraham to bless the entire world from this tiny, humble little people in the middle of a desert. Jesus' ministry didn't end with him ascending. It didn't end with Peter or Paul or John. It still continues to this day because we are Christ's ministry. Because the followers of Christ were to become a nation of priests themselves, not a sect of us, not a small privileged group like the Levites were. But all of us, every one of us, are burdened with carrying his cross, carrying on his ministry in our own time and era, carrying on his ministry in whatever means and in whatever area he calls us to. We may not get the most glamorous position. We might not be called to do the most glamorous thing, but that's not the big deal. It's not a, it doesn't matter because it is better to be a doorman in the kingdom of God. It's better to be a janitor in the kingdom of God, picking trash up off the streets in the kingdom of God than to be a king in the vanity and emptiness of this world. The position we will hold, the job we are led to do, isn't important as long as it brings God glory. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. We've covered several of these appearances to the disciples and apostles during the 40-day period, but the most important takeaway from the verse is the why, why Jesus appeared to prove, why Jesus appeared to his apostles. Jesus did appear to prove that he had indeed risen from the grave. He did appear to redeem Peter or to strengthen the faith of his disciples like Thomas, but most importantly, it was to continue teaching them of the kingdom of God. All throughout each of the four Gospels, people reject Christ or come to a false conclusion about Christ and what he had come to do because they wished him to usher in the revitalized and glorious kingdom of Israel, a kingdom of man. But that wasn't what his kingdom would be or be about. Christ's entire ministry was about ushering in the kingdom of God. And I get the issue people had with that. It's the same issue people have with it now. Why the wait? Why is it taking so long? Well, we are still in the preparation stage. We are still preparing for the kingdom by being the messengers of the Lord. We are being the messengers that he has seen fit to send out and deliver the invitations, the summons to the kingdom. Now, some people are accepting those invitations. Some are tossing them aside, but our work isn't finished. And honestly, I don't think it will be finished until everyone who will accept Christ comes to accept them because we are elect due to his foreknowledge. So God knows when that last person will come to know him. And God is loving and patient with us. He is loving and patient enough to not act and bring forth his kingdom before that last person comes to a saving knowledge of Christ. 
That's his love for us, his perfect love and his perfect justice, both exercised by his perfect sovereign will. It's not late. He's not late or tardy or tearing. God is simply waiting until everyone is aboard before he closes the door. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the father sends you the gift he promised. As I have told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, now now we see a change of scenery here as we move into the book of Acts, where the other gospels of Matthew and John speak of the disciples going to Galilee during these 40 days to meet Christ. Luke never records those meetings. He focuses on Jerusalem. So as we were studying from John the last couple of weeks, that gospel ended with Jesus and the disciples still in Galilee. Well, here we pivot back to Luke. And the disciples in Christ have returned to Jerusalem, probably for the upcoming Feast of Shavuot, which we as followers of Christ call Pentecost. Uh, It's the 50th day after Resurrection Sunday. And as Christians celebrate it because that was the day the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples of Christ. For the Jews, though, this was the festival of first fruits. This was the day that the Jewish people were to feast and offer up the first crops and the new harvest to the Lord, as commanded in the Torah by Moses. So Jesus was once again gathered with his disciples in Jerusalem, or maybe just outside of Jerusalem in the town of Bethany again, though Per Luke 24, it seems like they were once again actually in the city proper, maybe even back in that upper room as they were before. But as they were gathered and eating together, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, to not return to their homes or head back to Galilee, but to stay in Jerusalem until the Father sends them the gift he promised. Until the Father sends them the helper Jesus had spoken of in the past until the Holy Spirit is sent to be upon them. Which Jesus explains by telling them that John the Baptist used water to baptize people, to use water to immerse them as a symbolic gesture of their sins being washed away. But that in a few days time, the Father would baptize them with the Holy Spirit, that they would be immersed in the Spirit of God, that they would be drenched in his power. But that there actually was a covenant, a a caveat, I should say, a condition to receiving that spirit. It wasn't a work. It wasn't some deed they need to accomplish, but simply that like all the promises of God, they had to trust in Christ. They had to trust in what Christ was telling them because the Holy Spirit wasn't coming in that, in that day, but in a couple days time, two days, three days, four, I don't know, but he was telling them, look, you're going to have to wait a couple of days. You're going to have to do something that is not like you guys. Because the, the, the disciples didn't know how many days it was going to be. And they couldn't allow themselves to become impatient. They were going to have to trust in Christ and be patient and wait on God's timing. You know, impatience, in, in we see it all through the Bible. We see it all through the book of Genesis, where it led to disastrous things for the fathers of the faith. And knockdown effects through on the nation of Israel's history. Abraham and Sarah were promised to have a great nation made from their descendants, even though they had no children. But even with that promise of God, they became impatient for a child to be born to them. So they took matters into their own hands, resulting in Abraham having a child with his wife's handmaiden, Hagar. And that child, Ishmael, grew up to become a strong become strong, a great hunter, a wild man, and a father of a great nation in his own right. Only that nation would become a long, bitter enemy of the children of Abraham. Lot and his daughters, they were saved from the destruction of Sodom by two angels of the Lord. But by the but in time, they were so afraid of everything that they ended up hiding off by themselves and trying to only go into the city, almost living as hermits, and only go into the city when they needed to. And in time, because of that, they gave in to fear and impatience, and Lot's daughters would give themselves over to sinful, immoral vileness, 
and have children outside of the guidance of husband and wife that God prescribed. Those children would go on to also become mighty nations and bitter enemies of the nation of Israel for centuries to come. If we continue to move through the Torah, we come to Exodus, where we find the Israelites not able to be patient enough to wait 40 days and nights for Moses to return. He's up on Mount Sinai, conferring with God as they begged him to, and they couldn't even wait for him to come back down. And because of their impatience, because of their turning from God to return to sinfulness, their impatience led to the death of 3,000 men from the tribes of Israel who wouldn't repent from that sinfulness they fell into following the creation of the golden calf. They wouldn't turn back to the Lord because they had, they had lost their patience with the Lord. Impatience is dangerous to us. It's an offshoot of pride and ego. It's, an, it's believing we are so important that we come first in all things, that we aren't to wait for something or someone, that our time is the most valuable thing in existence and no one should be wasting it, that we are the main character of all creation and all things should revolve around us. But we aren't. We aren't the main character. God is. Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is. Our all-creative, all-powerful, all-loving triune God is the main character of everything. And we need to be patient enough to wait on his timing. Because his timing is perfect, whether we see it or not, whether we like it or not. Jesus commanded the disciples to go forth and spread the gospel, the good news of salvation from sin and the gift of eternal life in Christ. To go forth and make disciples of all the nations. Now, he was telling the disciples that in order to do this, in order to go forth, they need to be equipped with the Spirit. They need the power of God. And for that, they need to wait. They need to hold themselves at the starting line, just waiting for God to drop that green flag of the Spirit on them and let them be off. Not for them to false start, not for them to jump out on their own but to be patient, to trust in him and await his leading, not to get out ahead of themselves and do in their own power, but to hold back and go forth in his power. It's tough, but good things come to those who wait on the Lord, who wait until he has revealed the path in front of them. They say patience is a virtue, as a sign of integrity, a sign of righteousness which it is because our righteousness comes from God. So we need to practice that virtue, be patient and act in obedience to his leading when he leads. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Lord, is it now time? Is now when you become the conquering king we've been waiting for? This question was asked time and time again, over and over. But Jesus doesn't condemn them here. He doesn't rebuke them for not understanding. Because the prophets spoke of the physical redemption of the nation of Israel, the same as they spoke of the spiritual redemption in the nation of Israel. And the apostles knew the scripture. So as they believed correctly that spiritual redemption had come when Christ rose from the dead, they then inferred and believed incorrectly that the physical redemption of the nation was right behind it, right on its heels. And it's really hard to blame them, blame them for looking at it this way. Life under Roman rule was tough. But then again, so was life under Persian rule and life under Babylonian rule and life under Assyrian rule and life under Egyptian rule and Moabitan rule and so on and so on. 
Israel had constantly fallen under the oppression of foreign rule because that's what happens when we step out from under God's protective hand. I mean, he removes it from us, but that only happens because we decide to step out on our own and he decides to allow us to have what we wished, to be our own masters, to do our own will instead of his. And Israel and her people were sick of being the ones oppressed. And they wanted relief. They wanted nothing more than to return to those few short decades of glory under David and Solomon. Only it wasn't to come just yet. He replied, the father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. And they are not for you to know. It wasn't to come just yet. Patience. Once again, Jesus is essentially telling the apostles to be patient. That the Father the Father alone knows the time. That it wasn't their place to know. And I've seen so many unbelievers and false teachers and false faiths that try to claim Christ as their own latch onto this verse as evidence that Christ wasn't God. Because if Jesus was God, then he'd know the answer to when the nation would be restored or the second coming would occur. But that's not really what Christ is saying. Christ actually doesn't even say that he doesn't know. See, it's that Father, Son, and Spirit are three persons in one Godhead. Meaning, each one serve a different function. I mean, I, and I know it's not a great analogy, but my hands, mind, and heart are all parts of me responsible for different functions, but still three parts of one whole. God is fa- the Father is God in heaven. His spiritual embodiment sitting outside of space and time. The Son is the expressed image of the Word of God the infinite logos, the creative logic of God that all things that have ever been made or ever will be made came from. And that's why we see Christ, why to see Christ is to see the Father. Because Jesus is God revealed, literally Emmanuel. He is God with us, amongst us. The Spirit is the influence of God over his creation, how he moves and inspires his creation. It's the presence of the glorious spirit that causes someone to soften and harden. Like Pharaoh, God tells Moses that God is going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But it's not that God is actively working to harden Pharaoh's heart, to turn Pharaoh from him. It's that God is telling Moses that when God's glory is revealed to Pharaoh, when Pharaoh experiences the glory of the spirit in his presence, Pharaoh's heart will harden in response. God's glory is like the warmth of a sunny day. It's wonderful. It's uplifting. But but, but depending on what we place out in that heat, it may soften or harden. Ice will melt. Ice will soften. Wax will soften. Clay, though, clay will harden. Cement, cement will harden. Same sun, same heat, same temperature different reaction. And that's why we pray for our loved ones to have their hearts softened to the Lord, for them to open up and accept the warmth of his presence, of his glory. Because we want them to come to see the wonder of life in him. We want them to know the warmth and the greatness of being in his presence, as opposed to that hard, cold life without him. But Jesus wasn't even saying that he didn't know the date and time. He was simply telling his disciples that it wasn't for them to know at all. And it wasn't his place as the son to tell them. And it may have been for a pretty good reason, to be honest with you. And that reason being that they wouldn't live to see it. That they'd come and go before the kingdom of God would come and go, would come. And the redemption of the nation of Israel would come far after their lives. 
Because here we sit nearly 2,000 years after this conversation with the apostles. This conversation probably happened around 33 AD. Here we sit in 2023 AD. A short decade of 2,000 years later. If Christ had told his apostles that truth, it may have disheartened them in a time when they needed as much courage and heart as they could get because they had a lot of hardship in front of them yet. As we talked about, not one of these apostles, save John, would live to be an old man. They would all die horrible deaths. And you're not going to tell them, hey, you're never going to see this in this life. You're just going to tell them, look, you're going to tell them exactly what Jesus told Peter in John 21. It's just not for you to know because you follow me. And to follow me is to trust in me. So go forth, do as you're led And while you should keep your eyes out for that kingdom, focus your mind on the task at hand, spreading the good news to all, because God has this under control. You follow Christ, you trust in Christ, meaning you trust in his plan, and his plan is perfect and all his promises are assured. Because the also, the also part of that truth is though they would not live to see the physical kingdom of God come, the millennial reign, they did enter into the gates of heaven when they died. They were reunited with the Father because of their faith, because of their trust. And that is something that we all trust in to look forward to. That promise. That assurance that even if we don't live to see the rapture in the coming of the kingdom, we will meet him in heaven one day. And then go on to the kingdom of God and the new heaven and the new earth in time but for now we do as we're led with one eye focused on the kingdom mind focused on our task spreading his good news but you will see power when the holy spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in jerusalem throughout judea in samaria and to the ends of the earth i would seen this pointed out a few times by different commentators, and it's so true. Jesus tells his disciples they will receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and then they will be his witnesses. He doesn't command them to be his witnesses. Jesus simply telling them that once they have the power of that Holy Spirit, they will be his witnesses. And that is so true. When we are born again, when we finally realize the truth of Christ, we witness to everyone. Everyone and anyone who crosses our path will hear about Jesus. I at work, I talk to people about, I'm not shy, but across my desk, which is a shared work area, by the way, I have gospel tracts spread out across my desk so that anybody can pick them up and read them. Because once I became a witness, that is what I do. That is why this program exists in a way as well. Once we have that indwelling the Holy Spirit, we go forth and tell everyone. We are like the shepherds that were around Bethlehem when Christ was born, running around telling anybody who would understand, anybody who would listen, that the Messiah had just been born. And... When we are born again, we do this so much so that actually when I was a child and teenager, being born again was seen as a bad thing. It was seen as a warning sign, a red flag to avoid that person. 
It was used as an insult to level at somebody. Man, when we were kids, when we were younger, we thought born-again Christians were just the absolute worst people because of the way they went around telling everyone about Christ. Because we found it annoying. See, normal Christians, they're fine. Catholics, they're fine. See, those kind of Christians never spoke up about their faith. They kept it to themselves. But not those born-again Christians. Those people were annoying and would never shut up with their Jesus talk. Constantly, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Non-stop. But now that I am one of them, now that I am a born-again Christian, I understand why we are like that. Because we want everyone to know what we know, experience what we experience. We want everyone to know the truth. We want no one to be separated from the Lord. We know what is to come. And when people say, why can't you keep it to yourself? It's because I want for that person what I have for myself. And it's better than anything they can get by themselves or in this world. And since I become a Christian, since I have been studying and growing and just moving my way through what is this Christian walk. Since I've read scripture, I understand what Jesus was speaking about in Revelation 3, 15 and 16. I know your works that you do neither hot nor cold. I could wish that you were hot or cold. So then because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I understand now what Jesus was saying and how he was telling us to be as Christians. I understand that Jesus was saying that we need to be either hot and useful, boiling water, you know, boiling water removes bacteria and impurities. Hot water warms on a cold night. It opens the pores to allow us to get a deeper clean of our skin when we bathe. But at the same time, cold water, cold water is refreshing. It quenches a deep thirst. It cools in the heat of the desert sun. However, lukewarm, lukewarm water, it does neither of those things. It gathers impurities as it sits around, uncovered. And it does nothing to refresh you. We aren't to be Christians who are lukewarm doing nothing of any value for the kingdom of God, hiding our light under a basket. We are to be hot and on fire for Christ, preaching his word everywhere we go. Or we are to be a refreshing place for those seeking refuge from the vanity of the world. One or the other of those seemingly polar opposite things. But they aren't because both are useful for the health of the kingdom and the growth of the bride of Christ, the growth of the church. No one should ever have to wonder if we are Christians. They should know by our speech or by our walk, whether we are hot or cold, whether we reflect Christ in speech or in action whether we warm or refresh. After saying this, he was taking up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into the heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. But someday he will return from heaven into the same way you saw him go. This scene wasn't just to be dramatic. It was done with a purpose. See, over the last 40 days, Christ had appeared and disappeared. 
just had been there one moment and gone the next. Jesus wanted his followers to know that this wasn't simply him disappearing, only to reappear later. That this would be the final time they'd see him on earth. This was him leaving this place behind to return to the right hand of the Father. To be our intercessor. And so Jesus ascended to the heavens until the disciples could no longer see him with their eyes. But as they stood there watching, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them and told them that Christ is home. But more than that, that Christ would one day return and that he would return the same way he left, that he would return one day descending from heaven bodily and visibly. He would come in flesh and blood in his glorified body and he would come where people would see him come and he would touch down on that Mount of Olives he left from. Christ will return. Christ will return. I know it's been 2,000 years, but Christ will return. Be patient. We've waited 2,000 years. And who knows, as much as I hope we don't have to, maybe we'll have to wait another 2,000 more. But what we can't do is stand still with our eyes staring skyward. We should keep our eyes on that goal, the coming kingdom of God, the return of Christ. But we need to keep our focus first and foremost on the task at hand, doing as we were commanded, taking the good news of him to all, spreading the seeds of the gospel to all, training up our children and grandchildren to take up after us and continue the job until that fateful day when our Lord returns. We need to focus on being a warm fire, burning in the dark of night to lead those searching for the narrow path. Or we need to be a cool refuge for those broken and battered by the cruelty of our fallen world. Because we don't know the time. And you know, it's probably best that we don't. Because we shouldn't be counting down the clock like a team trying to run out a clock in hockey or football or basketball. We need to treat this like baseball. The time doesn't matter. The game isn't decided by time. It's about how many outs are remaining. And until that last out is recorded, until that last person to be saved in Christ is saved in Christ. Our job continues on and on until he calls us home and we leave our portion of the burden behind to be taken up by those who come after us. Patience. Patience in him and his promises. Because there are more than promises. There are more than what our earthly selves consider promises that we break and we fudge and we forget all the time. They are the assurances of God. And when the perfectly loving and perfectly just and all sovereign God gives us an assurance, nothing can break it. So, I hope everyone had a great time tonight, and let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to gather like this again. Thank you so much for another lesson that was placed on my heart, Lord. Thank you for continuing to use me as a tool for this, in this way, as a way to glorify you and spread your word and deepen my own Christian walk and instruct my own family, Lord. Lord, please help us this week to do your work, to be hot or be cold for you, to 
always keep your kingdom in mind, but to focus on where you let lead us this week to the efforts you lead us to be a tool for your glory. And Lord, please use us as that tool in whatever way you see fit. And please fill us with a refreshing of the Holy Spirit so that that way we can hear that still small voice in us when you do lead us so we don't miss it, so we hear it and move with it and follow you to where you would have us be. And I pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. And with that, blessings to everyone watching. And I hope to see you again next time for another installment of Tilling the Soil.